In addition to talking about volatility and acceleration, you know, we must recognize some constants. So what is constant? There is no doubt that with high debt there's going to be less money around. So companies who have not taken care of their balance sheet uh, or companies who are placed in parts of the world uh, and don't have access to global financial markets are going to find themselves in a very hard spot. Instead, companies who have taken care of their balance sheet over time are probably going to find themselves in a strategic advantage today. I think that's one constant. Uh, the second thing is, uh, you know, being in machinery and looking at industrial customers, probably some of our big customers have more money on their balance sheets than ever before. So big corporate clients actually have lots of cash today, have lots of access to capital and lots of cash. They don't necessarily want to spend it and they don't always want to spend it in the product we are offering them or you know, whoever is offering it to them, but they actually, you know, are not cash constrained today as they were maybe uh, uh, some years ago. Uh, I think the third thing is those global customers uh, spend money on innovation, even as consumption is not growing on aggregate and everywhere. Product differentiation to gain market share is at an all-time high. So if you have innovation, if you can bring innovation, people do have the money to spend on that innovation. And I think the last thing is, more than ever, uh, big global customers uh, see the world as their domain, right? They, don't, they no longer define themselves as regional player, European player, American player. They really are becoming truly global. So as you are facing these customers, even at times of uh, big stress and big uh, economic discontinuity from some perspective, uh, these are still people that need to be served uh, in China and in Brazil and maybe in Russia simultaneously. Maybe they have frozen their capital expenditure program for Europe for the next uh, couple of years, but maybe they're investing very heavily in America. So to the extent you can actually express that dimension for them, uh, opportunity abound. So I guess you know the double mask, uh, the dark and bright mask are, are more relevant today than ever. You really don't know if you have a big problem or a big opportunity. It kind of depends on how you see the world and where your position and how you can take advantage of these opportunities. Um, I'll take a few minutes to, uh, to speak a little bit about Coesia. What is Coesia? Coesia is uh, a group of industrial companies. We operate in uh, three segments. Uh, Primarily, where we do about uh, three quarters of our business, advanced automated machinery. Uh, about a quarter of our business is um, in uh, industrial process solutions, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that side of the business. And a tiny portion of our business is in precision gears. Um, we have two sectors and a hobby. Our hobby is precision gears. I call it our hobby not only because it's tiny, but uh, also because it's uh, lots of fun. So we do uh, gearboxes for uh, Formula One, uh, we are a key supplier to Ferrari Formula One. We actually designed and produced the gearbox with which uh, Kenisek supercar, a Swedish supercar, won uh, the world's acceleration records uh, last year. So uh, when they needed the gearbox and they, when they needed to design that, they came to us. It's a hobby because we, this is not an area that we hope it will ever become more than 2% of our business. And we have two important sectors. Uh, in machinery, um, we are quite active, as you see, in uh, uh, three main sectors. Uh, health and beauty, broader area, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, um, and also consumer goods. Uh, food, beverage, household, uh, personal care, confectionery. Uh, bakery beyond that, uh, hygiene disposables, uh, so quite broad perspective, and tobacco where we are one of the handful of uh, leading suppliers uh, for machinery to the tobacco industry. Uh, I come from the pharmaceutical industry, uh, they say technology standards are pretty high in pharmaceutical machinery, I think tobacco eclipses in terms of complexity and sophistication uh, what you see anywhere else in the machinery industry. That actually helps a lot because it gives us a lot of technology we can actually leverage in other sectors. Um, industrial process solution is a division that was enabled through our acquisition of Flexlink uh, at the end of last year. Um, industrial process solution is basically a division that supports both end customers and also some of the OEMs, some of the manufacturers of machinery. Um, Flexlink, as you know, is a world leader in production.
production logistics, global leader in production logistics, based here in Gothenburg. Um, Appa and Letus are um, um, two leading companies in pharmaceuticals, one in inline printing, Appa based in Zurich, and the other one in uh, uh, vision inspection and track and trace, uh, and quality inspection, Letus based in Frankfurt. Um, you also see that uh, in our group uh, we have uh, two very important Swedish companies, both Flexly and Norden. It's not just by luck that we have invested in Sweden. I would actually show you some thoughts at the very end uh, which uh, justify uh, why we see Sweden as a place to invest if you are in the machinery and the mechanical engineering industry. Um, so these are a few thoughts about how our group companies hang together and uh, why I'm particularly pleased to be uh, in Sweden today and in Göteborg. A uh, few key statistics about the Coesia Group. So uh, uh, we will do about a billion two this year. Uh, we are present in 27 countries, more or less 5,000 employees, spend quite a bit of money on research. It sits between 5 and 6 percent every year. And uh, what's most important, we are present with production facilities and technical support and assembly and the rest of it uh, where our customers need us. Need us. So, we have about uh, 48 production facilities around the world of different sizes uh, that allow us to be very close to our customers. Um, past few years, uh, coming back to crisis versus opportunity, have been a big opportunity for us to accelerate our growth. A bit through acquisitions and maybe half through acquisitions and half through organic growth, we have seen our business grow by about 50%. Uh, uh, and we are in a position to finance this growth while keeping a very, very, very conservative uh, balance sheet and approach. Now, performance versus sustainability. For us, obviously, growth, uh, you know, um, I come from the pharmaceutical industry as background. Um, people in the pharmaceutical industry say that growth is the only unmistakable sign of life, right? Uh, cells grow if they are alive, and if they are not alive, they don't grow. So, growth uh, intended uh, in the right way is really a, a, a sense of dynamism and actually having ambition to grow in the right way is, uh, I think, a key driver for survival in the business, not just for success. Doing it sustainably is another story, so having a long-term mission, looking at all your stakeholders, uh, looking at the sustainability of your supply chain, looking at the way you invest in technology, trading off tomorrow's profits for five years from now profits, uh, understanding your relationship with the communities you operate in, that's sort of a way to define how you want to grow. And obviously uh, having values and living by them, actually believing them, is uh, yet another dimension but which I think in the long run is the only way to keep your employees motivated and to keep your credibility with your customers and your stakeholders. So that's sort of how we uh, look at, at growth and, and how we try to translate our ambition to sustainability. Um, that is all nice and it's all very uh, conceptual and uh, maybe uh, a borderline philosophical if you're not careful with it, but actually it needs to become very concrete. So we have five very clear uh, strategic pillars that we try to pursue in parallel. Um, I will uh, give you a few thoughts, uh, just to be quick, uh, on a couple of them, which I think are actually fundamental. All five of them are key. I don't think you can survive in the long run if you are in our business if you don't do all five of them more or less well over the medium term. But innovation and focus and having a global footprint, I think, are more important today than ever. And I think that for the reasons I said in the very beginning of the presentation. What distinguishes the experience of a deep crisis and the experience of opportunity between companies today, I think more than ever, is the ability to innovate and the ability to support customers on a global basis. So, let's talk a little bit about innovation. Uh, in Coesia, among uh, 5,000 employees, you will find uh, 1,200 people in our engineering department. Um, you will even find a group that goes beyond the single sector and really gets best practices and gets top-notch top cross-fertilization solutions around the world. So we're actually, sort of, in terms of people focusing on it and money spent on it, we are obviously trying to have with our actions uh, uh, 
follow with our actions what we say with our strategy. Um, innovation nowadays uh, has a eco-friendly and ecological sustainability dimension which is stronger than ever. So uh, customers and customers perceive uh, intelligent innovation and perceive the ability to be sustainable in terms of energy and materials and the rest of it as a key uh, innovation dimension. I will give you three examples of what we do very briefly. This would be an example that we do in Acma Volpac, our Italian uh, consumer goods packaging company, Italian Spanish consumer goods packaging company. This would be innovation on products. So we have patented a product we call the brick pouch. Uh, a brick pouch would give you less material used than conventional packaging. It would take 54% less space to actually put on a shelf the same volume of liquid. Um, user convenience, ergonomics and other characteristics uh, very attractive in terms of uh, not having paper printed over things and being very having material that is very, very attractive to the consumer. And finally, thinking about what happens after the consumer uses it, a uh, way to dispose of it in a very space uh, efficient way. So, things to do with uh, the package, things to do with the line, northern, uh, just across the country, short train, train ride between Gothenburg and Kalmar, and you are in northern, uh, new lines for filling, tube filling for pharma that really focus on energy efficient, efficiency, you will see these lines consume less and less and less energy than in the past to do the same type of product, maybe with even more uh, operating efficiency behind it. Last but not least, not just the product, not just the packaging machinery, uh, but also the way we approach lines. I mean, what FlexLink does is goes way beyond conveyors. FlexLink gives you application engineering that allows you to optimize factory. This would be an example of uh, a factory that has transitioned from conventional solution that used 177 or something like this uh, linear conveyors. Uh, down to a solution that probably uses uh, less than 65, actually uses 63. Uh, not only saving in terms of uh, material, but really optimizing space, optimizing efficiency, optimizing product flow, and allowing uh, this factory to consume 80% uh, less power when operating this type of conveyor than this type of conveyor. It's obviously way beyond plastic, aluminum, and uh, servo motors, it is about know-how uh, and ability to optimize the way our customer wants to produce their products. Lucky to have all three types of focuses and approaches within our group, and we actually believe that for the long run, we need to be able to give complete solutions, or at least touch different aspects of uh, challenges for our clients. I will... Uh, finish just uh, making one point about our global presence. Uh, today uh, we are global. Uh, it, it is quite challenging for a billion euro company to be truly global. Uh, you need to be very focused on it and need to be willing to spend the resources to do that. Uh, I also think you need to be very careful to not create more complexity and to allow things to happen in a fluid customer friendly way. But, you know, it's more than uh, many companies can say, and this is obviously a focus for the future, I think this is going to be a key success factor in terms of being able to satisfy customer needs. I will finish, um, just finishing with a couple of thoughts uh, on uh, European dynamics. And you know, everyone is bleak nowadays in Europe. We talk about manufacturing crisis, we're all terrorized that someone is taking our jobs away from us, uh, factories are closing and the rest of it. And I'd like to make a reading of the situation which is, you know, uh, maybe slightly different than, than uh, what we hear about every day. And you can make a reading of a situation that's different when you actually distinguish what you're talking about. So people tend to talk about manufacturing and trade balances in manufacturing and then services. And really, if you look at manufacturing, not all manufacturing is the same. There is capital intensive manufacturing, you know, people that produce paper or people that produce uh, plastics. Uh, there is labor-intensive manufacturing, uh, you know, uh, wood or tourism or other 
types of things, uh, sorry, tourism would be in services. Um, um, and then there is actually knowledge intensive manufacturing. There is a manufacturing where uh, the R&D you spend is a high percentage of your value add. And there, I think we have some interesting observations in Europe. And there we have the emergence, depending on the sector, of clusters, of geographic clusters, very much like people like to talk about Silicon Valley or whatever, uh, that actually our poles of excellence are quite dynamic in Europe. I will show you three examples of that. Um, one is an obvious one, uh, and you don't need to read all these numbers, but basically this is about Germany. So Germany is a country that has a primary export deficit, about 5% of their GDP. Uh, their total export is about 50% of their GDP, right? Uh, and no one has any doubt that Germany is a powerhouse in terms of industrial competitiveness in Europe. You look at where that advantage is coming from, and it's really a lot of it is coming from knowledge intensive manufacturing. Uh, here, the categories would be pharmaceuticals and chemicals, computing, communications, and electronical equipment, transport equipment, and other machinery. Other machinery would include the sector we're here uh, to be in a fair about. Germany would have important degree of competitiveness, 1.4 if one would be the average among the 17 leading OECD countries, 1.4 net exports and a pretty competitive situation, not just generally but also specifically to knowledge intensive industries. Everyone knows about the sort of valleys around Stuttgart and valleys around Munich and supply chains and the rest of it. There is another country which is a very interesting uh, example, uh, which is also a very positive example, which is Sweden. Sweden has come out of a very deep crisis, you know about it better than I do. Today, Sweden would actually have a percentage-wise, one of the highest percentages of net exports in terms of trade balance, positive trade balance. Sweden would be exporting about 47% of its GDP today, and Sweden would be fairly strong in terms of position in knowledge intensive industry. What I would like you to look at is when it comes to machinery, Sweden would be slightly above average and would have a net export benefit. Sweden, both with its automotive and transportation industry background and its mechanical engineering background, is actually a hub of excellence in terms of supply chain, competencies, education, universities, innovation. And it's no question that uh, a group like Oasia that invests globally would be very interested in uh, 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 encompassing uh, leading Swedish uh, packaging companies and uh, technology companies in its uh, perimeter. The last country uh, which uh, presents a very interesting study is Italy. And Italy is a country that, because of all the reasons that you read about in the economies, has actually on average lost a lot of its competitiveness. Uh, it's only exporting about 30% of its GDP today, a lot less than it did 20 years ago. And a lot of people read in the newspapers about Italy, Italian competitiveness. One thing you should see, though, is there is an extremely strong uh, sector in machinery and mechanical engineering in Italy. If you look here, uh, you would actually see a dominant, uh, both absolute and relative perspective, a presence of a machinery industry in Italy. In terms of uh, competitive index, uh, with Germany at about 1.4, Italy would be at about 1.9. Uh, very much like uh, the different valleys in Germany or Silicon Valley, there is what they call the sort of Bologna machinery value thousands of suppliers, universities, engineering schools, uh, lots of uh, know-how, very, very much focus on innovation. So, in a way, it's not an accident that a group like OASIA is coming out of Italy. It very much could have come out of Germany, and there are quite a few, or Sweden. But if you actually think about these three slides, it actually tells you that we should not be thinking in averages. We should be thinking specifically about sectors, and actually even better about value chains. And that has implications, so we can excel and we are excelling uh, in specific sectors. We're talking about packaging here. When we're thinking about what to do, 
to drive this, you need innovation, you need education, and you need to protect your supply chain. So implication of that, if your value chain or supply chain, for someone like Flexling or for someone like Norden, is within Sweden, and if you worry about every day about the Swedish krona, right, like everybody, what is your response? Is your response to go get your supply from Thailand? That might solve your Swedish Krona problem, right? Good. But then what happens five years from now? Are you flexible? How long does it take you to do your testing if you are a high technology company? Who supports your engineering schools? Where does the know-how happen? What will be the epicenter of the innovation of a company? So the implication of all this for a company like us to be very specific, but I think for all of us, is to be quite protective of our value chains, of our supplier chains, if we're going to drive innovation. It's the very same thing in Italy. Uh, and companies like us should be thinking about long-term performance and sustainability, which means healthy suppliers, if they are nearby and it's good, keep them nearby, make them more efficient, be intelligent about your procurement, keep your innovation close to home if that's where you have it, and be very positive and be very optimistic about what Europe can do in sectors where Europe is very strong. So, instead of reading about all this misery in the newspapers, I try to think of the world more in terms of an opportunity for a reindustrialization of Europe in some sectors, not in every sector, in some areas of Europe. And I think thinking about it in this way allows us to focus a lot more on what we can do versus what we can complain about. Thank you very much.